At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. A recent study from Rice University revealed that the average three-year-old child from a high-income family is exposed to 30 million more words than a child raised on welfare. The implications for early childhood learning and later educational achievement are dire without intervention. Two Sacramento State professors, Dr. Celeste Roseberry McKibben and Dr. Robert Peretti, both from the Department of Speech Language Pathology and Audiology, join us today to discuss the issue of early childhood literacy. There are claims that I've heard that California and Virginia determine the number of prison beds for in the future based on third grade reading scores. Is that true? Absolutely. So when states like California and Virginia are planning the number of prison cells to build, one major variable that comes into the mix is how many third graders are reading below grade level. And that's a major factor that determines the number of prison cells. I don't know whether to be astonished or aghast at that statistic. I mean, yeah. what does that say about our society? Well, what it says is that it's um, we almost rather incarcerate than educate kids. I read a recent statistic, Scott, um, this was from the Heart of America Foundation, that it costs us forty to fifty thousand dollars a year to house one prisoner, and we spend eight thousand a year to educate a school aged child. So it's just it's much, much more cost effective to educate kids and prevent these problems. And I wish society would go in that direction. And, and is this information, I mean, for you all as professionals in the field, is this something that's commonly known and we as the public just don't understand this, or is this a, a new revelation of information? I think we've known it for quite some time, I would say, but I think it's becoming clearer and clearer, and the statistics are becoming uh, more dire and gr more grave as we go forward, and I think it's good that the information is getting out there because I think everyone needs to know this. Dr. Roseberry McKibben, why is this issue at this moment such a critical one for our state? Well, I think because, of course, the budget has affected a lot of things in terms of less money for education. And also, um, we have something new called the Common Core State Standards that is um, basically, it's national and the requirements are even more But what difficult. is it? But what is Common Core State? Uh, what does this relate to? Well, the Common Core Standards are a, a set of standards. All states have state standards and have had state standards for some time. But the Common Core Standards now are being adopted by most states. And this is for like K through 12 education? Education. Yes. Twelve education. They actually set forth from K through twelve the academic um, the academic requirements or the academic standards that students should meet at each grade level, um, and all, uh, most of the states have now adopted them in California. But how does this relate? to this issue of the 30 million words not being oh, okay. spoken. Yes. Yeah, good question. So basically, um, okay, if you have a child who comes to kindergarten at the age of four years and 10 months, has never been read to, never opened a book, has heard 30 million less words than some middle class kid who's had a lot of books in the home and been read to, when they start off as four and five year olds, their trajectories are so different. The low How so? How so? The low income child is already hugely behind the eight ball because they've heard a lot less words. Um, the average middle class child has 13 or more books in the home. In low income neighborhoods, there's one book for every 300 kids. Really? Yes. yes. So start one yes. book. One, one book. book. That's out of Philadelphia statistics. So that lower income child who's been raised in poverty starts kindergarten already behind the eight ball. And those standards are already in place in kindergarten yeah. that students need to meet. So if they're coming without those language and literacy experiences, they're really going to be behind in terms right, of being even able to meet those beginning kindergarten well, standards. Well, Dr. Pretty, what are the conditions typically that you find in a households where it is that there aren't books and that those 30 million words aren't being spoken? I think there's a lack of resources and I think also there are parents that are working very hard to maintain the household, keep food on the table, and oftentimes literacy is not as high as it, as it could be on the priority list. And so we want to empower parents to think about that. Um, can you add to that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you get, let's say, a single mom who's working a couple of jobs. She has several children. She, first of all, doesn't have the money to buy books. She's trying to buy food and put a roof over the head. And second, parents are tired and they're not aware of the fact that even five minutes of reading a night could make all the difference in the world. Yeah. So parents really lack resources of time and money and knowledge. Well, you know, it's funny about this because I would think that many times, okay, you're a parent, you're working hard, you've got your kids. You, I don't believe that they're, they're a parent naturally doesn't want their child to succeed. No, they Absolutely. do. But, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of learning many of us assume comes through television and well if our, our child is watching Sesame Street and mm -hmm. the electric company or whatever they're getting this information anyway so what's the need in the age of technology to have a physical book as opposed to just get it off the screen? Okay, well basically that's a really good question because a lot of us do think, okay, educational, Sesame Street, but the point is that we're talking about emergent literacy, which is basically a term that means mm -hmm. that sitting down and physically opening a book and reading through it builds on those very, very early skills that TV just can't give you. That's right, and talking through, receptive, receptively we take things in by watching television, but, but really mastering language, which is the key to successful literacy, takes expressive use expressive use of language and practice with the conventions and of our language and interacting with an adult, with, an adult with, with the language. So let me, uh, let's assume that a child didn't get read to. They're in second, third grade now. And what, how do we as a society intervene to catch that child up? Well, I think we want to intervene as early as possible because by third grade, kids need to really be, uh, well, they're not being taught to read anymore, they're reading to learn. So really getting in there, you know, before well, kindergarten. Explain the distinction for me. What's the difference between the two of those? You know, it, kindergarten really is very academic these days, but kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, there's a lot of things happening in the classroom that are helping kids learn to read. And they're teaching you how to read. You mm. know, phonological yeah. awareness activities, um, word fluency activities, and, and language activities, comprehension activities. But but by third grade, students really need to be reading to learn. So science, they're actually reading math, science, math, social studies. and they need to read text to be able to get the information. There's no more real instruction in the classroom because we need to get to, to the educational piece. So without this reading and this platform of reading when children are extremely young, it, it's almost exponential through the math, pe the math piece of learning and these other parts of early childhood education and it hampers those aspects as well? Oh, it absolutely does. In fact, it was interesting that a recent statistic showed that 70% of prisoners don't read above a fourth grade level. So by the time you get to third or fourth grade, if you're not reading, you, um, you're you not gonna be able to keep up with the, um, with the academic curriculum, especially these days where yes. things have gotten harder at younger grades. So we're going to see more and more societal problems as these you know common core state standards become, they're, they're pushing harder for littler kids to do harder work. Now, I, I, I got I to say that I was surprised to find out that speech pathologists and audiologists were at the forefront of trying to address this issue because it's not something that I would normally associate with my, with, with my understanding of the practice. How did your field get involved in leading this effort? Well, I think um, what many people forget is that, uh, or don't think about, is that we're very diverse in what we do. We work, they think of us as individuals who work with communication disorders and swallowing that's disorders. That's what I, yeah. well, yeah, that's yeah. what I think. But communication. Pronouncing your sound. Right, right. Communication boils down to speech and language. So they think of us oftentimes as the speech teacher or the speech therapist or the speech pathologist, but they forget that language term. And really, receptive and expressive language is a lot of what we do. And the sounds of our language and the words that we use in our language, the vocabulary. Understanding speech. Them. And the ability to comprehend our language, that leads directly to successful decoding of text and understanding the text that you've read. Um, it's all about language. So, so uh, tell me how it is that the efforts that you and your colleagues are making, give us an example of, of how it actually makes a difference in taking a child who might have started out with a deficit with regards to hearing those 30 million words and getting them up to speed. Uh, can you point to anything 
that, that, that would explain it to me? You know, I absolutely can. I have a friend, her name is Carla Contreras Holfish, and she published this in our state newsletter that she grew up in a home, um, a lot of poverty, child abuse, violence, alcoholism. Um, the family, you know, received aid to families to dependent children. So anyway, she ended up getting some speech language therapy, and she um, got exposed to children's books. And through reading those mm -hmm. children's books, she realized there was a life that was different than the life that she was leading. So she grew up to get into our major. She's current, Carla's currently getting her doctorate in speech language pathology. She's successful, her daughters are successful. And it was basically literacy and children's books that made her realize, hey, there's something better for me out there. Well, it's, a, it's a great success yeah, story. It is. Uh, uh, but a cynic might say that for every Carla out there, yeah. yes. how are you going to reach the family in Rio Linda, in Auburn, in South Placer County that needs to intervene now with their own children, whether they're below the age of three or whether they're in third grade itself? Right. How are you going to reach those people? Well, I think you've made a good start with the book drive, and we're at the university trying to, to um, empower parents through a couple of programs. But would you like to talk well, about what, the book Yeah, what drive? book drive? Well, okay, well, basically, because, yeah, this is kind of a two-part program where I started with the book drive, and then Dr. Preddy is doing classes. So we started five years ago collecting children's books. Um, they show that access to reading material is the greatest predictor of literacy and academic success. If you don't have books, that then... Really? Yes, yeah. so availability. So knowing that, five years, years ago I started a book drive. I'm at Sac State. My students at Sacramento State have been generous contributors, my church, Bayside Church, and to date now we've collected 52,000 books and we've distributed them all over the greater Sacramento area and we're going international, Samoa, Ecuador, the Philippines. Really? But yeah, oh, it's been wonderful. So 52,000 books where we're physically getting into the hands of families. And Scott, the biggest thing for me is that it's great to borrow a library book, but it's even better to own a book that you can read over and over and pass on to your younger siblings. For our parents who don't speak English, it's a great opportunity for them. So that's been phase one, and we're continuing that book drive. So again, 52,000, we're hoping for another 50,000 in this coming year. But that's how we've started, is getting books into the hands of the families. Uh, is it, it, let, let me ask, uh, though, is it in this age of technology, where people have f smartphones and tablet computers and computers themselves, a physical book seems a little bit like a buggy whip in a wheel. And, and are kids really in to reading books when they've got all this technology competing for their time and attention. I think that's a huge issue that we face. And I think the expectations, you know, I've, I've heard some reports that some school texts may go electronic at some point in the future, but kids still are expected to go to school and read books and deal with text. And so we really are trying to, to get that out there. Incidentally, let me, let me just ask this question to, to, to sort of build on that. Is the experience of reading a physical book different in terms of the, the outcomes for the child, different? reading it physically or reading it online? I'm not, that's a really good question, Scott. I'm not personally aware of any research. And in fact, if, if kids want to even read ebooks, that's a good thing too. The yes. point is to interact with another person about the book. So whether a parent reads an ebook on their iPhone or a physical book, I don't know of any research that shows that paper's superior. And I would encourage either. I yeah, would I would too. Either. Yeah, parents have an iPhone and they can download an app that reads people. Actually, you just said great. something that, that, that I missed earlier, and that is that it's the parent reading to the child. Yes, it's yes. the interaction. It's not just having a book in the home for the child itself, but it's actually the parent reading to the child right. and modeling the behavior. Yeah, and a lot of parents, you know, Scott, you said something earlier that's important. The parents love their kids and they want the best outcome, but they don't, they haven't been made aware because no one's told mm -hmm. them that sitting down with some techniques actually can make a really huge difference. And that's what Robert's doing. That's what we're working on with students at Sac State. It became really clear as the book drive took off that students really wanted to reach out and become involved in community service 
service projects. So we actually began small by creating um, a list of questions, simple questions that parents could ask children before the reading experience, during the reading experience, and after the reading experience. And uh, the students developed that in one of the courses at Sac State, and then it just took off, and we've had community support to translate it into now 11 languages. So let me ask you a question. My, my sister works for a program called First Five California, and oh, she yeah. talks about this thing, this magical thing called the kit all the time that goes out to new parents uh, all over the state that the counties distribute and it's all basic early childhood information. How does the work that you all are doing deal with the mission of First Five okay. and preparing children? I think Dr. Okay. Roseberry can speak yeah, to that. Yeah, we've been really privileged to work with Mayor Johnson's Sacramento Reads program with Samia Stigler specifically from the mayor's office. And so we have been able to give um, Mayor Johnson's office and First Five specifically about 5,000 books. Mm -hmm. And so they take those and they give them to the families so that they can begin reading at the early ages. Now, one, one of the things that I hear about all the time about this thing called the kit that First Five California puts out is that they have to translate it into many different languages. We, we've been having this conversation for a few minutes and talking about this sort of from an implied assumption of talking about English. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but how do we reach families in this increasingly diverse state where English is not their primary language? How, how do we, are we addressing that? I think we, we both are in some ways, and I think the state is in some ways. We are trying to do it through our grassroots efforts with our, with our reading list that actually would be fine for any family. And I think Dr. Roseberry has, has some really good tips for families that don't speak English and may not read in English uh, to just interact with the child around a book. You can just be talking about the pictures in a book um, in whatever language. Yeah, right. So there's two ways. One is Dr. Pretty's, you know, sheet of reading tips that, as he said, has been translated into 11 languages. The other thing is we have a little acronym called CARE, C-A-R-E, Comment, Ask Questions, Read, and Expand. And you can do that in Hmong, Spanish, Tagalog, any language. You don't have to physically be able to read. But just to open up a book with your child and talk about the pictures, research shows that that's really effective, too, mm -hmm. in building story skills and preliteracy skills and preparing kids. Let, let me go. Let me go one, one further step back. All right, assume that the parent themselves in these low-income families only has a proficiency at fourth grade or something. Right, okay? that's well, very, we typical. Talk, very right. typical. Yep. How does a parent who has fourth grade or below reading proficiency themselves actually act on your advice with their own pre-three child? Yeah, so we, I, I've um, worked with a lot of that because mainly my clinical experience has been with families in poverty who receive um, aid to families with dependent children. So what we teach them to do, and Dr. Pretty can build on this, mm -hmm. is to sit down and just open a book and just talk about what's happening. You don't have to be able to read. A lot of my parents I work with as a clinician don't speak English, so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay to just sit there and talk about the pictures sequentially, ask questions, just use very simple techniques like that. That's effective too. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if there's a 30 million word deficit and the parent doesn't have 30 million words of their own, right. how are they going to help that child get past that 30 million mm. word gap. It's a challenge, and I think starting small and empowering parents is the best is the best tool that we have. So in other words, what you're saying is your tool is not a panacea, but no. it's a step no, forward. No, it's a beginning. No, step forward, Absolutely. and I think that's really what we're trying. It's, it's grassroots effort. We're pleased to be involved with some projects with um, the Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services that involve uh, parent training courses that we're developing for, for uh, the near future. And what we hope to do there is actually have parents come in. Um, parents are already actually involved in, in coming to courses there, and we have students who are, who are being trained um, under my direction to do some parent training, interactive parent training with parents and books. Um, so that's another small step that we're trying to take. Let, let, let's take a step back and, and, and think about policy for a second. You two as clinicians and as thought leaders within this community, what is it that if, if you could wave a magic wand, you are now queen, you are now king, okay. and, you could, wave your, and you could wave that scepter, <laughs> right? my tiara. That's right, take the that's right. Take the tiara. That's right, and you could wave that scepter if there was two or three actions that either we as a region or school districts 
specifically or some entity could take to really move the needle on this problem, what would they be? I would say the number one thing would be for people to donate books and get books into the hands That's of simple. every family. Yeah, on our blog, we've got donation sites, and I'm sure the blog will be shown. But yeah, it really, really begins with getting books into the homes of families. Like we said earlier, Scott, it's shocking to me and to so many of us from middle class backgrounds that one book for every 300 children and under resourced That is shocking. It, it's stunning. Yeah. I mean, I, I had to read that statistic like 50 times. It's like, really? So to go back and to just get books books into the hands of families, that's number one. Yeah. Another thing that's been really wonderful is we've worked with Sacramento Reading Partners and they've shown that, let's say that an adult such as yourself goes in and spends one hour a yes. week with an at-risk child, 26 hours of one-to-one -one with an adult can boost that child's reading skills by a whole year. So community, really? Community yes, I, yeah, really, we've looked at the numbers, 26 hours of one-to-one. -one. So you go in, you see Johnny Jones for an hour a week for 26 weeks, his reading gets boosted by a year. So community partnerships with so volunteers So community partnerships are huge. with reading partners, getting books into the homes. Those yeah, are the are there any? Uh, is there a partnership you can point to right now that people can get involved? Reading with? partners has been wonderful with our university program, and they actually go into many local schools. But they're actually larger than just our region. But they've seen positive results, and our students have been involved. I think last year, Robin. this year, 112 uh, juniors and seniors signed up to go out and be mentors to young to young readers in the schools. Mm -hmm. Um, as for reading partners and last year I believe you had. Yeah, in the year 2013 from Sac State's Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology, we've had approximately 200 of our students Total. get out there and get involved and they're making a huge difference. Wow. So community partnerships and volunteers are huge and spreading yeah. the word about Now that. King Peretti, I don't want to leave you out. She, she, <laughs> got, she got to pronounce her, her commandment. What's yours? I think the other thing that I'm really big about is empowering parents to talk in the home. Some of our colleagues on the East Coast did a study recently where they really saw positive improvements training parents just to talk and dialogue and journal things with pictures, simple really? pictures. Yeah, because migrant getting, farm workers. Hmm. You know, talking about about this this word gap. I mean, it's just really getting language going on in the home. Right. Talk while you're cooking dinner. Talk while you're in the car. Talk about things. Let, let, let's talk about let's talk about migrant farm workers and the more rural parts of the state because there's a there's a sometimes an implied assumption that all of these are urban issues. Right. But let's talk about out in rural areas where it is that access to things like libraries and other other resources like that are are more scarce. What are we doing there? What what's what's the situation on the ground? That's more difficult, I think, because of, just because of proximity. But I think the schools play a big role there, and they really do get information going. And I think you have actually can talk about Samoa, American Samoa, as an example of how we oh. can still reach out to these communities. Yeah, definitely, people who have absolutely nothing. So with, with you know Samoa, the Philippines, Ecuador, the migrant families, again, Scott, I hate to be so simplistic, but a lot of it is about getting books into the hands of the parents. We and like simplistic here. So oh, good. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And we tell them, love talk, read. Love your child with attention, talk to them a lot, Get and open going. books with them, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a wonderful study just very quickly that Robert alerted to. They did on the East Coast where they had migrant farm families. They just sent home paper and pencils and had the families draw pictures and journal and speak in Spanish with their children. Before and after testing revealed, the kids' reading and oral language yeah. scores went up. Well, uh, what, what magic happens through a process like that that, that drives Dialogue. Them? Language. Language, uh, talking, yeah. yes, just even talking. Taking your child to the store and saying, there's some Rice Krispies on the shelf and we're gonna buy those instead of the Cracker Jacks over here because those are better for your teeth and you won't get cavities. Yes. I mean, you know, just, just, <laughs> just, and just easy re, stuff you know, like Simple that. recast, like your child says, yeah. oh, car, and you say red car. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. you actually add to what they're saying. Get language going. You know, here's a simple one that I really love that I did with my own son, Mark, who's now 15, is the child says brown dog and the parent says in Spanish or Hmong or English, yeah, look at that big brown dog wagging his tail. Research is conclusive that even that simple language technique can expand the child's um, language hugely. It really works well. Anybody can do that. No matter how poor, no matter what language they speak, that technique is available to all of mm -hmm. us. And that's how we start to close that word gap yeah, slowly. Yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. And build oral language for literacy. And so 
there, there are two components to this. One is for parents and children that need help. The other is, is that how the rest of us can get involved. A very, a very quickly in our final moments, how, uh, where should parents look to get help in this region? I think definitely parents can look to professionals in the region. Um, the Mary Jane Reese Language, Speech, and Hearing Center is, is a great resource for Say that name again. The Mary Jane Reese Language, Speech, and Hearing Center at California State University, Sacramento. That's our clinic. That's part of our training program. It's a great resource for families who feel that their child might and be And in their K through 12 school, is there anybody they should, in particular they should try to talk to? In K through 12 schools, what would you recommend? Um, probably the speech language pathologist if there's a Head Start teacher. And also the Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services has a lot of parenting classes. Okay, that and, and then and then finally, if if any of us want to get involved in helping to battle this issue, where should we go? You know, Scott, if um, they check our blog, sacbookdrive.blogspot.com, that has donation sites. So you can get your children's books off your shelf and bring them to one of those donation sites, and we will dole them out All to right. families. And once again, repeat that uh, that last sentence you said, love. Oh, love, talk, read okay, with and, our child. And on that, thank you both very much for thank being you. in Studio Sacramento. Thanks. It's All been right. a pleasure. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. Five Star Bank community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.